Welcome to The Daily Crew, episode 16, your source for unimportant information and other fun things. Joining us today is our very first guest, Brian Brown. I am Tyler Douthat on my right, Amanda. My left, Ben, another Brown, I think unrelated, although they share a similar haircut. <laughs> uh, we go through a bunch of topics we found online, and then we'll also talk to Brian at the end about his book and publishing and authors and all that, which is just kind of just a really... I. Just to scratch my own itch mostly. Just to learn about the publishing world is interesting to me. All right, so the first random topic of the day, Ben, what do we have? Uh, the first one is, what is the last thing you want to hear from a pilot? <laughs> what is the last thing that you want to hear when you're up? When Sorry, you're, it's my first time. You, that's a good one, or, oh no! <laughs> yeah, oh no? <laughs> oh yeah. no. Who, who here knows how to fly a plane? <laughs> oh. Yeah. Anyone yeah. have any flight experience? Like when yeah, they say, so, like, anybody yeah. know a doctor? Is there a doctor in the house? <laughs> yeah, is there a pilot? Yeah. <laughs> is there a pilot here? Right. Yeah. I don't know. Like, or, like, does, any, or, does anyone have any extra beer or <laughs> yeah. something like that? Can I get some, uh, or needs, like, some extra prescribed meds or something? Yeah. Right over the intercom. <laughs> uh, stewardess, please, more vodka. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like what kind of fun trick do, would you like to see me do? Like yeah. do like a barrel roll in the air? Yeah. Like, uh, watch this. <laughs> watch right? this. Yeah. Buckle up. I always think that's uh people give like men and women drivers and all this. I think men are bad drivers on purpose, women by accident. Because because <laughs> men are always saying, Yeah, like watch this, right? Watch well, yes. Because they, they do it on purpose. <laughs> and I and I think which is probably worse than doing it by accident. That's not a rise of women, but it, like, no, Karen, sure, Karen sure. would say the same thing. Like she, my wife always says, like, women are worse drivers than men. I'm a great driver. Are you? Mm-hmm. Do you who do you think a better driver is men or women? That's a whole... It depends <laughs> on the person, but I'm a good driver. Yeah. My yeah. wife's a better driver than I am. See? <laughs> is she? Yeah. How, Ben's wife is a better driver than him, even though uh, he disagrees with me. I will strongly disagree with that. <laughs> I am a very good driver. I have my days, but I'm... Why do you think she's a better driver than him? Um, because I've ridden with both of them, <laughs> and sometimes it's just not safe. I don't hey, feel safe riding with you, Ben. I am plenty safe. <laughs> I can guarantee you that. You think you're plenty safe? I think I'm plenty safe. In my younger years, less so. As you get older, kids and stuff, yeah, tend to do a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. Is your wife better than you? Yeah, she right. says that I'm t- I'm too bumpy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, 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 I slow down too fast and mm-hmm. take turns too, too hard. So she's much smoother than I am. Ben. So, yeah. Sounds like Ben. Yeah. <laughs> a little, a little aggressive at times. Right. But uh, I don't know. So are you, are you saying that men is why they created the autopilot? Uh, I don't like. So I'm just joking. I don't think it's. <laughs> well, I think it's it's the future, but yeah. it's already present. No, I just think that, I think men try to do like the whole like bro mentality, yeah. trying to like one up somebody or show off, yeah. leads to lots of things, including reckless driving. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would say because of the autopilot, but just don't they say like most of those planes fly themselves anyway? So like a lot would have to go wrong, right? Or that. For... Especially isn't it takeoffs and landings, isn't it like all autopilot? Yes. I don't know. I don't really know. That's what I'm, I was just, Wondering, I mean, I've heard that a lot of it is like it's autopilot, they can basically just put a button and they pretty much fly themselves, other than taking off and landing, like you said. But I don't know. My mom, she worked at Sky Air Force Base for a long time and she would talk to like ex pilots, a lot of them were pilots in the military and then would become like civilian pilots for airlines and stuff like that with the skill set. And they would say it's not the same thing at all, like everything's automated, mm-hmm. you just like push a button and it just does everything mm-hmm. versus actually flying. Mm-hmm. And just push a button and set a course, and that's it. Like, it's not even, it's not the same thing at all. She also yeah. said pilots were very, very arrogant Ooh. all the time. We were just talking about that. People who are very smart, you have to be smart to be in the Air Force, mm-hmm. right? At yeah. least decently smart. And mm-hmm. uh, a lot of smart people are a holes. Are they? <laughs> I feel, you know, like. Yeah. Because they, it's just, there's a different level of thinking. You think they know more than you? They think they know more than you, so they present that in a different way? I don't know if it's on purpose. 
I don't think it's on purpose most of the time. Yeah, I think it's just a... Like a natural kind of sending so kind like, of way. They're just kind of... It seems, it seems like they're talking down to you, but they're really not. I mean, they, they don't think they are, but yeah. but if you're talking to them, it may appear that way, even yeah. though that's not the reality. I don't think things that you want to talk about with them are very interesting, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. That's <laughs> yeah. a general thought. Yeah. yeah. You think smart people are a-holes? <laughs> um, it, it, really, it, it really depends. I think a-holes cross every section of life. <laughs> Whether you're smart or rich or poor or, you know, they're everywhere. So it's hard to... Yeah, yeah. yeah. To <laughs> For sure. It really yeah. is. It really is. Uh, another example for what you don't want to hear a pilot say is, does anyone know, does anyone have parachute experience? You know, <laughs> that would be yeah, not good. Yeah, don't ask me that. <laughs> Do, like, commercial planes... They don't have enough parachutes for buddy on board, right? I don't know if they have any. I, I Maybe don't like know. for the that's pilot. A good, that's a good question. I have no idea. I mean, they talk about like if you land on water, use as a flotation device. But how common is that? If a plane crashes, there's an awful lot of land they're flying over. Yeah. yeah. It seems like that's not all that helpful and seat belts and all that. But yeah, probably like they're not saying throw your parachute and jump out the, the stuff. Yeah. If they crash, probably in bad shape. Right. Yeah. It's probably safer to crash in the plane than to jump out with a parachute. Yeah, I don't. And, um, I don't think there's a plan for any commercial airlines <laughs> to have, you know, hundred yeah. parachutes on board. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. If you're going, if you're going down, you're going down. Yeah. There's been a couple times, like uh, my wife and I, we fly for personal and for work a decent amount, and there will be really rough turbulence sometimes, and there, it'll cross my mind. It's like we're going to crash, and the kids aren't going to have any parents left. Once in a while, that crosses my mind. Right, like you get on that flight, babe. I'll get yeah. on this one. Yeah. <laughs> like, like that, driving a car, you feel like you're somewhat in control. Like maybe you can zigzag out of the way or avoid something. You have some level of control in situation. Some level in yeah. a plane, you just walk with a ride. You're like, if they crash, they crash. Yeah. And that's just all there is to it. It's just like statistically, you're way more likely to die yeah. in yeah. a car accident. Yeah. Well, I think sure. planes are better maintained, and it takes a lot more to become a pilot than it does become a driver. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Is there even, like, can you just show up? If you're, say, you're 18 years old and get a driver's license, you have to pass a test or something. Mm -hmm. It's been so long since. Yeah, I don't think you have to have driver's ed if you're 18. You, you have to pass I don't know. I wonder if that varies by state. That could vary by state Probably. and stuff like that. With, you know, some might require driver's ed or... So many like driving hours with a, a you know with a guardian or somebody that has a license or I don't know but Missouri yeah, yeah. I mean, it, well I know in Missouri it's it's a little bit different after you're eighteen because you I, I don't think you have the uh, the driving requirement where you have to have so many hours mm -hmm. after you're eighteen um, but if you're sixteen and getting a license then you have to have a, it's you know like a, a thousand hours of that's probably way too much but yeah there's there's a, a certain number of hours that you're supposed to have in training mm -hmm. um, before you can actually pass the the real test i remember driver's ed mm -hmm. it was like forever ago though it was i did really well in driver's ed me too yeah me too but i i had driven a lot before that <laughs> me too so yeah good time because my mom she's from the country and out there it's a whole different thing mm -hmm. it's like they would I was like sitting on their lap, like my dad's lap when I was a kid, and even like driving around like my grandparents' neighborhood, which is like a one street. I remember being that a decent amount as a kid, and it was strange because I didn't know realize how unusual that was. One of those things you think is normal when you're young, mm -hmm. and you realize you get older, and like there's there's kids that have never touched a steering wheel, mm -hmm. like actually driving until they get the driver's ed, yeah. and you kind of forget that's probably lots of people. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that's a scary job. I agree. <laughs> but don't they have like controls? Don't they have like a brake on that side? They have a pedal on their side. Yeah. They're like a gas pedal. Too. Like if someone's yeah. coming at you, the brake's not going to help a whole lot. Right. To get out of the way. All right. What's next on our list, Ben? All right. So the next one is what is the best thing to invest in nowadays? The best thing to invest in? I hear a lot of talk about crypto, cryptocurrency. I've been hearing that in the news constantly. I feel like that's everywhere you go now. It's had a bit of a rough patch the last few months. Yeah. Cryptocurrency. I fortunately got a lot out of, out of crypto just the way things worked out mm -hmm. before, before, before it all tanked. But I'd like to learn more about NFTs. I don't really understand them. And so that's something that I, think a lot I, of I want to learn more about. I like Instagram a lot. And, taking 
everyday pictures and so I've got it in the back of my mind like can I create an NFT at some point or yes you can what, yeah mm -hmm. I know theoretically I can and but I yeah I don't know the steps I just haven't really it's really it. it. I haven't done one but it's pretty straightforward Do you guys know what NFT stands for what non Bungable. Non, but what's the second word? That's the weird one. Fungible. Fungible. Yeah, fungible. Yeah. Non fungible. I don't know how to spell it. I don't even know how to pronounce like it for real. Fungus, but ibble. Ah. Okay. Fungible. Fungible. Fung well, no, not fungible. Fungible. <laughs> fungible. Weird. Yeah. Pretty much to use the blockchain to uniquely identify ownership of a digital asset. Because people think like digital, like, like you could own a physical thing and say this is the only one in the world. Like I own that. But digital stuff, people think of you can have a million copies in 10 minutes of anything digital, which is true. But to be able to authenticate who is actually the first person to do that and have ownership of that, whether it be a picture, a video, a tweet, anyone like that, you could then you could tell the world I was the first one pretty much to have this. Okay. Interesting. And then based off of that, you can carry value. Because say someone like Kanye West snaps a picture of himself somewhere and then you could have that be you could have that auction off like as an NFT. Like I was the first one to have that picture. Like I own that picture. Mm -hmm. And yes, there is copies of it everywhere, but to have everyone in, un, is it inarguably or unarguably? In probably. In, inarguably, yeah. Yeah. be able to say that this was, this was mine first or mine. And that's kind of where the value is at. But like for creators, it's a big, big thing because it opens up a lot of, a lot of options, books, videos, pictures all over the place because yeah. then you can have people that actually want to have access to you and care about your content a lot like say uh people who don't like only fans almost it's, it's not dissimilar from that because then you could own like the like the first digital copy of a book or something like that sure so non-funkable digital ownership of assets mostly yeah do you think that's a good thing to like invest in nowadays would you would you recommend it? Uh, I think the NFT market is, a, is a, right now a lot like the late 90s tech stocks. Okay. Everyone thinks it's an easy way to make money and much of them are going to go to zero. <laughs> and you're going to think, oh, I paid a thousand dollars for that, which you, which you did. But is it going to be worth that in 10 years from now? Maybe. Like some stuff survives in the late 90s fine. Like eBay, Amazon, Yahoo, they're all still around. But many of them... Uh, what is it, like pets.com yeah they're not really ar around much anymore so it's a i think uh the sustainability of it scares a lot of people and like it seems like a wild wild less of get all get nfts and some will be worth a lot many be worth nothing yeah i'm not doing it yeah i'm not doing it <laughs> <No, laughs> i don't i don't I'm trust it yet. i think it's too else. new I, I'm, I'm like that with anything yeah. that's too new i just don't yeah. trust it it's too new because most people like have heard it but don't really even understand what it is yeah, and that's how I tell you how new it is. Like people say, "What's email? How does that work?" <laughs> What's yeah, the yeah, I'm interested in it from the creator standpoint yeah. and having you know stuff that okay, that's something that I produced and it might be of value at some point. But it is a little confusing how it's also treated like currency. Mm -hmm. um, so it, yeah, yeah let, let's let it shake out a little bit. And yeah, maybe have the first NFT bubble. And, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. yeah. And look at it. Let's see how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm afraid of all of it, so I just stay away from it. Yeah. I would say long, broad tail investing, probably just like index funds every month, Indeed. long term. Okay. Pays up pretty well long term. Yeah. All right. Sounds Amanda, good. what's your investment yeah. advice for today? Uh, give your money to a broker. <laughs> <laughs> Let them just do whatever they want, and then hopefully, fingers crossed. Yeah, you're set. Yeah, I'm. I'm with her. I think there's there's people who study this and spend time on it and and know a lot and go to an expert. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. I agree. I'm not trying to lose all my money. <laughs> yeah. on, like by my own fault. Invest in a yeah. retirement plan. Or, yeah. You know, yeah. 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 Something like that. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I feel comfortable doing that. Yeah. I get yeah. that. And one day I might change, might jump on the cryptocurrency thing. But that's another thing. I feel like the cryptocurrency is constantly changing. It went from like Bitcoin, then it went to some other kind of like Ethereum, Dogecoin, 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 Dogecoin and stuff like yeah. that. I feel like there's way, it, it just keeps jumping. Mm -hmm. So you're like, okay, what is the one? What's well, the one that I need to be on? Because I don't know. A lot of these cryptocurrencies are trying to do like the pump and dump scheme. You guys heard of that? The pump and dump scheme with stocks too? 
it's very much a real thing. So say, say you create something, whether it be a company or a cryptocurrency, and you, and you have a way to get in front of people, you say, get this now, get this now, get this now, it's gonna go up in value. Then everybody, you get enough people to buy, and naturally with economics, then that's worth more than everyone that was ahead of, ahead of that time, they all sell when it's high, because they know it's not worth anything, and then actually what sells when people lose money except for the first people. So you pump it up and you dump it. Yeah, that makes sense. Works in stocks, that was a big deal, because you Wolf of Wall Street, Yeah, that was a big portion of that. Not so much later on, but during the beginning, when you remember the, uh, at, when you go to like a strip mall with the, the broker's license, remember mm -hmm. that? It was all like pump and dump, the same thing, build it up and just sell it. Yeah. Which, yeah. Is, which is pretty illegal, but people do it all the time. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, it's just not right. <laughs> yeah, it's not right. No. It's, it's like the definition of taking advantage of people. Yes. Yeah. It's not like it wasn't on purpose. It's just on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> what do we got next, Ben? Okay, the next one is... What is a bad example for sharing is caring? What is a bad thing to share? A toothbrush. Toothbrush. <laughs> yeah. Viruses. Yeah. STDs. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Germs in general. Germs in general. Um, man, you got any good ones, Amanda? Um, if you're monogamous partners. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else? Do you ever watch that uh, like sister wife stuff? I love that. Karen watches watched it all the time, and it's 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 a fascinating lifestyle from the outside, like yeah. not on the inside of the situation, but to look on the outside, it's like there's like three, four wives and one dude. I I have to work hard to keep one wife happy. Right? How do you keep four <laughs> happy? I don't understand the the time in that, and how is there not like a weird ick factor with women, women different nights, different beds? How is there not? From a human standpoint, a weird jealousy issue with that. It's so weird. Some people would like to be in polygamous relationships. Yeah. It works for them. I don't know about that type of situation. What's their religion? Are they Mormon? I think they tend to be it's like a an outskirts of Mormon. It's like fundamentalist, okay. something like that. I'm okay, yeah, because the um, It's not the main thing anymore. Yeah. It's like a they, they kind of distance themselves from the the I think it's been like 100 years since they've endorsed polygamy, or at least longer than that. Yeah, where the man can have mm -hmm. however many wives. Yeah. yeah. Have you guys ever known anyone? Maybe not like polygamy, but like open relationships? You guys ever know anybody? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like, how did it work out? One specific person <laughs> I can think of, um, her and her husband, they would um, have different partners to sleep with, basically. Yeah. But then she got attached to someone, and so of course he got jealous, and they ended up getting a divorce. So there's a good story. Yeah, Feel that, good. That, that, that seems really predictable. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. That jealousy factor. It's hard to. It's mm -hmm. hard to just d disregard it. Yeah, I think it's wired into us in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 If you choose to be in a monogamous relationship, and then. Yeah. You have a deal of outside mm -hmm. um, relations, but nothing else. Yeah. That's I think where it can be. Yeah. But polygamy. Yeah. If you you agree to join. Yeah. 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 And if you go, I'm not one to tell people how to live their life. If that's what they want to do, but it seems like it'd be hard to be okay with long term. I think yeah. it's wonderful. You think yeah. so? Yeah. I feel like that's it's it's a lifestyle. It's not something you just turn on and say, I'm going to give this a go. It's something that's kind of been rooted. Are most of them probably life. raised that way, so it seems normal to them. It, it's mm -hmm. just, yeah. yeah, I just feel like, you know, you, you're, you're, you're hearing more and more about it now. So people are, because, you know, a long time, you, like, you didn't really hear people talk about being in those kind of relationships. It just wasn't, you know, common. It's taboo. Yeah, taboo. But now it's coming to the forefront a little bit. Still hard to understand for some people. But like, like I said, I think it's just one of those things where, you gotta live it to know it to understand it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, one of my biggest things about it is that it's unfair to expect everything from one person. <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. And that's why we have friends, family, whatever. But you could love someone deeply, but say you don't want, you don't want to have a sexual relationship with them. Yeah. But there's someone else that you also love deeply, and you can. Mm -hmm. And there can just be. It's yeah. lots of communication. Yeah. 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 Once in a while, I think about you, you hear couples that say they want to do an open marriage, and I always wonder 
how did that go the first time someone brings that up <laughs> in some yeah. marriage? Like, come again? What was that? Yeah. I feel uh, like that's a day one conversation. Uh, that's got to be well, like... Well, just it, maybe you don't feel like that. Yeah, right that's, away, that is very true. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how you go about this. I don't think, <laughs> it, I don't think there's yeah. really a, a textbook. Like, like on a first date. Yeah. Are, are you into open marriage? <laughs> yeah. It's going to be really important yeah. Yeah. going yeah. forward. <laughs> you know, it out there pretty early on. Ben, how do you think Hollywood responds? She's a, she's a funny woman. She said, uh, I think I want to have an open would, marriage. She would just make fun of me for even asking. <laughs> you know Holly Bell, too. What yeah, do you think yeah. she would say? First, she would, ah, she would laugh so hard. Um, be like, do what you want to do, man. You know what I mean? I like, which like, means don't do it. You can talk it. like her. Yeah. <laughs> which means the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Do you yeah. have an opinion on um, open relationships or anything? I mean, I think it's maybe a way to avoid real intimacy, um, you know, on both sides. Because for the women, you know, maybe the guy's not around all the time and this is a, a safe person, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. but then he's not around and they can kind of do their own thing. And for, for the man, he's not fully committed to like one person. Um, so I think there's some, you know, psychological reasons maybe why someone might want to do that because they're afraid of actually being hurt. Sure, that does make sense. Now you're, would you consider yourself a fairly liberal woman? I was thinking that, but I wasn't going to pour it in your mouth. <laughs> Just, so make sure you read that before I say what I'm going to say. Yeah. I think if you look back on a lot of like polygamy, what some would argue there is a sense of like control and get in line and like you're one of a group versus Versus one. Do you have any any take on that? About control. Control. Yeah. You think it's? I don't know. I think that there's less because it's not too. It's not. I mean, you can have an equal partnership, monogamous in a monogamous monogamous relationship, but someone probably usually always has the upper hand. Um, probably the one makes there are more decisions and. But I think that in a poly like in a polygamous relationship, there's no. I don't know for sure, but I would imagine there's not one person that controls everyone, except for the situation of like sister wives. Yeah. You know, so in a joined, agreed upon polygamous relationship, I think it's everyone has their place, but not necessarily control. I don't know though. That's just what I. We gotta talk to a real polygamist. That would be interesting. Yeah. yeah. That'd be fascinating. I haven't done it, but that's what I want to do. I don't want to be in a monogamous relationship. You, you would like to be a polygamist? Mm -hmm. Okay. Which way are you open? Like, like you want five men? <laughs> or you want to be one of like five women or both? Or what both. is both? Yeah. Yeah, I think a nice um, thruple. <laughs> thruple? Yeah. Or like a, I don't know. Quotable. What do they call it? Poly. Polyamorous? Polyamorous? Yeah. Something like that. Okay. I didn't know that. I learned something mm -hmm. new today. Yeah. Okay. I think well, it could be really great. It seems like one of those things that could be really, could be, if executed well, could be really, really fulfilling for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. If executed well. And some people, if you go on dating websites, obviously you guys don't, or I don't know. I know you're married, no, but, no, right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, some dating websites, there are couples looking for someone to join their relationship. Really? Yeah. Yeah. One I time I, there, it was an attractive couple. I was like, oh my God, look, I don't even, I've been on dating website like twice ever. <laughs> but so this one time I was like, oh wow, like they seem really cool and we match. And then later we unmatched. I was like, one of them didn't like me. <laughs> so that sucks. <laughs> Cause like just to meet them, that would be really cool, you yeah. know? So yeah. That is interesting. Mm -hmm. We have any, another question I think? Yes, another question. Okay, so the last one is what is, Completely unappreciated. Completely unappreciated? Yes. What's out there that just people just don't appreciate enough of, uh, I'll say, indoor plumbing? <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. You went that route. I was yeah. thinking like hard work, <laughs> like putting work. in work to <laughs> yeah. benefit anything. Like, I'm just trying to think of like where we would, I mean, 
like indoor plumbing changed so much. Like yeah, we get to live longer. Yeah, it's like, like, it's like the right. things you take advantage of, you never think twice yeah. about like electricity. Yeah, you I never think twice. You know about. what? I think it's gone. I would say McDonald's only oh, because <laughs> that's <laughs> a lot of people's meals at least a couple times a week. And yeah. then you know how like sometimes it's refreshing is to be driving somewhere you're not familiar with and you're in a strange town and then you see that golden arch and you're like, yes, I know what that is. I'm comfortable with that. I'm going there. Something You're right. familiar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like when we I, take trips, like with the kids, we oftentimes stop like at a McDonald's for lunch, just because we kind of know what we are getting. Yes. Yeah. Like it's not going to be a huge surprise what happens here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna say the, the thing that came to mind for me was just cars and being able to travel like that and drive wherever you want. And I mean, if you could go back in time and talk to someone from 300 years ago, they would just be so fascinated by yeah. that fact that you can, you know, drive cross country and all that. That's stuff. probably like yeah. phones and technology. Because I, I wonder if, if we had a like functioning smartphone, say 500 years ago in the time travel, would people try to burn us at the stake and say like, this is witchcraft, <laughs> yeah, would sure. we be worshiped yeah. as gods? Yeah, like yeah. what, Yeah, it would definitely stand out. Like you can just do whatever you want here the whole time. You could just say it did anything too, um, like don't touch it, you're gonna catch on fire. You know what I mean? Like so then you could be very powerful. If yeah. You, like, uh, you know, they're they're like, like Star Trek episodes. I don't think you, you guys probably don't watch Star Trek much, do you? Once in a while? Uh, no, no, I don't. Star Trek? No, no. Not really. Well, anyway, but I watch it pretty regularly, and there are episodes here and there where they'll meet cultures that aren't as that are just be earlier in their evolutionary advance of technology and things like that and will end up being worshipped as gods because like they can just show up and they can disappear out of thin air with their transporters yeah. and like <laughs> worship them as god and you think if you take if you have a enough of a technological advance over someone else there's a good chance they'll view you as like superhuman god type thing mm -hmm. which is pretty pretty wild to think about it, yeah it would be hard if you were going back in time um you know and you went back Quite a bit, you know, two, three hundred years or more, and you were trying to explain to people modern society and where you're coming from. Yeah. Like, how would you explain computers? Yeah. I mean, how how would you explain, would you television? explain it? Yeah. yeah. And you know, no one would I'd say it's a screen. What's a screen? <laughs> yeah. 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 It'd be really hard. Yeah. Just yeah, you're right. being recorded, you know, mm -hmm. that in itself is. Mm -hmm. Like you record it for later. What with what? Yeah. But yeah. Just no more word of mouth. Yeah. Well, lesser. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Without even like the baseline of understanding, it would be seem seemingly almost impossible to even understand. Yeah, I don't yeah. even understand even, it at all. Yeah. <laughs> even photography would be hard to explain. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what else is unappreciated? Oh, go back to the point. I would say pilots or autopilot. Autopilot. Unappreciated. Pilots. Polygamy. Yeah. Pilots who oh. don't drink. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're unappreciated. Yeah, you always thinking to be at a like at a. An airport having a drink and pilot sits down next to you. Hey, how you doing? You just get on the same flight. And yeah, you, go to the yeah. front, you go to the seats. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. All right. Is that our final the questions here? Yes. All right. The next segment is our special guest, Mr. Brian Brown. L. And this is episode what, 16, Ben? Yes. And this is our first interview, so bear with us as we figure out what we're doing. But we came across him, to be honest, on Twitter and looked through some bio stuff and was interesting and I just kind of want to get a feel for a lot of this stuff. So, Brian, first of all, thank you for coming yeah, yeah. in. Thanks for having me. So, you are an author, is that right? Right, yeah. So, I am, uh, I guess, a little about me. I'm from Springfield, Missouri. Um, I was a, a business reporter there. I, I worked for a Springfield Business Journal for six years and had worked for a small community newspaper before that. Um, and so, I've I went back to college kind of late. I went back to college when I was 28 and, and got my, my journalism degree. And my dad owns a small um, uh, marketing company here in, in Kirkwood, mm -hmm. Kirkwood, Missouri. And uh, he wanted me to come up and work for him. And I had left SBJ and was trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. And so I, I decided to, to do that. So I um, came up here about four and a half years ago and started working for him. And um, he's been um, writing books for just like five years now, mm -hmm. um, but he's written uh, a ton. He's written several, it was something he always kind of wanted to do. 
and it took him about a year and a half to write his very first book and then uh, there for a while he slowed down a little bit but he was writing a book every three or four months and when we hit the uh, when the pandemic hit in 2020 um, our uh, there was a, a time there of about six weeks where um, our business had completely dropped off and we didn't have anything to do and it was me and him and um, we had uh, laid off uh, you know we had two workers and had laid them off and we were trying to figure out like what we're gonna do and he said look I've got this idea for a book which ended up being the first book we wrote together called um, Lake Honor and I want you to help me with it and I struggle with editing and that sort of stuff mm -hmm. but I've you know, push this idea to my publisher and he's interested in it. And um, we could sit here and twiddle our thumbs or we could write a book together. Now your dad, is that Alan? That's Alan. That's, I saw a co-author, right. yeah, Alan Brown is Brown. Right. Okay. So, um, so we wrote Lake Honor in about six weeks. We wrote it really quick and then, got, then get started getting business back at, at work. And that was um, a story that was based on uh, his own personal experience. He's a, a fiction writer. He likes writing mysteries and thrillers and uh, that sort of stuff. And um, But he had been sort of involved in something that had happened back when he went to school at um, School of the Ozarks, which is now College of the Ozarks, in, uh, down by Branson. Mm -hmm. And um, he had gone there in 73, and there was this one um, uh, area that had uh, they call it Lake Honor, um, but it was a, it's really a, a pond with a fountain and two bodies had shown up in the middle of campus in this, in this pond and no one had known what had happened and it had been kind of a big deal. And he ended up trying to investigate that, um, a little later, you know, mm -hmm. like about a, a year later, he, he started getting into it and had decided at the time that he wanted to be a writer and was going to try to go down that road. And he met with a detective. And so the Lake Honor book is about his experience, but it's, you know, with names changed mm -hmm. and, and that sort of thing. Um, but it's all kind of relates to his experience. So we, we wrote that one together and, you know, that was good and interesting, but it all kind of centered around this, um, this, uh, fake detective, uh, named Booger McLean. And he had introduced him in, uh, one other book. And then, you know, we had had him in Lake Honor and he was really wanting to do like, uh, a, a, a mismatch of fact and fiction where we investigate a real case um, where we could actually kind of study it. And the biggest case in Southwest Missouri, um, at least in, in my experience, was really about the, the three missing women, um, which had happened back in the, the early 90s. And he started looking at that and saying he wanted to write about it. And I, I initially told him, no way <laughs> this is a really bad idea we shouldn't do this uh, because people care a lot about that case and um uh, you know back at the time when this had happened there were uh, uh, posters and, and billboards everywhere that had the the three women on them and it's just something that like if you lived in springfield missouri in you know the 90s there um you know you saw their their pictures everywhere and heard about the case and it, it was something that never got solved. It's basically three women who disappeared and like they just disappeared. Um, two of the, the, the girls, I say they're girls, they're 18, had um, uh, just graduated from Kickapoo High School and they had been partying that night and so forth and they were supposed to stay at one friend's house and they, it was too crowded there and they decided to go back um, to one of the other girls house and um, so these two old friends and their mom some somewhere in the middle of the night disappeared and they've never been found um, you know there's tons and tons of theories about what's happened but they've never they've never been found and um, so we have you know with gone in the night gone in the night essentially like the more we talked about it and I knew my dad wanted to do this was probably going to do it on his own. Um, I, I wanted to. I wanted to be involved and help 
make sure that it was kind of done right and done with respect for the families and, and that sort of thing. So it's a fictional investigation of a very real case. So if you're not familiar with the case or if you, you kind of remember it or whatever, it's really interesting because you'll get the real facts of the real case, but it's being told through this fictional narrative okay, with okay. this fictional detective. Yeah, I, I read the description and I tried to understand that very concept because it talked about uh, a real person missing in case and a fictional search for truth. Right. That's why I was trying to figure out what that meant. Okay, so it's a, it's a real event that happened and then in the book it's a fictional story of Booker McLean solving that. Is that or right? Right, to solve it? He, right, right. He's attempting to solve it, and he's actually, you know, working with. Um, my dad had had sent me in the book uh, to work with Booker in Springfield and and try to try to solve this case because the pandemic had hit. We couldn't work. And so why don't you go work with Booger and actually try to solve this case? So you guys inserted yourself into the story. Yes, That's yeah. Pretty cool. Which That's was another reason that like <laughs> it kind of freaked me out and all that. But I really think um, it's been received well. And I, I, I think we did it right. I, I at least think we did what we were attempting to do. Well, I was, I, I looked it up because when I found this, I just Googled and Facebook stopped and looked at Amazon okay. and all that. And I saw... This, this book and has a pretty overwhelmingly positive reviews on Amazon for a book, but it's not the easiest thing to do. Like, well, there's there's enough of a something there because the market has spoken in some form. And that was and that was interesting. It made me think, but like my own natural curiosity is on things, especially like the business side of mm -hmm. a lot of this stuff and authorship and books and all this. So you had mentioned your dad's publisher, is that? Right, so he, he works with a company called Double uh, W&B, uh, Publishing, which is a division of Argus Books, and he's published a couple different books with them. Um, I I want to say he had published a half a dozen books or so before he had worked with them. I, I, I might be wrong about that, but I know with his first book, with his first couple, I mean, he was sending out his manuscript to 30, 40, 50 different publishers and mm -hmm. trying to get published and you know some of them you hear back from right away some of them you don't hear back you know from for six months or, or whatever yeah. and this particular publisher was uh, uh, pretty receptive the only thing was they they don't do editing they they require that of the the people who are bringing them the copy they'll read through it make sure it's a good book you know decide if they're going to take it but they don't actually do the the, the editing on it that's a risk for them. Yeah, yeah, it is. And it was um, it was something I didn't fully understand with Lake Honor because we had had some, you know, mistakes in it in the original manuscript. And uh, we had gotten some interest from a, a Facebook web, web page called Love My Ozarks where people, you know, I had mentioned the, the book and mm -hmm. people were really interested in it. So he, he rushed and, and published it right away. And then we were finding mistakes in the book and like had to go back and edit everything. And if you, if you read it now, if you buy it now, I think it's clean. <laughs> but I didn't realize that going in. But that was another reason he wanted help with, you know, writing and stuff because that editing is just not his strong point. He's a very task oriented kind of person and really likes the idea of like doing the book. He's, a, he's a, 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 an old uh, marathon runner and um, completing the task and then seeing it published. That's really like his thrill. And, um, you know, and he, he just struggled with some of the editing, so. And maybe this, this is my ignorance. I always picture a book editor like, oh, you need a comma there and a period there. I guess it's more than that. Right, right. well, I, I mean, it depends on the situation. For, for our, with our setup, um, I'm doing a lot more than editing. I mean, we're talking about how we want to do the book, particularly with Gone in the Night, that was something that was a very, you know, it was a team oriented project. Mm -hmm. uh, Lake Honor was a little bit different in that, you know, that was kind of his story. He had a story he wanted to tell and he just needed help with it. Um, but with Gone in the Night, I mean, it was very collaborative, like, okay, how are we going to do this? What are we yeah. doing? And he would normally write a chapter, send it to me, tell me, you know, what do you think? And then I would 
um, add stuff here, take stuff away, work on the flow, and edit to and yeah. the commas and that. Sort yeah, I'll say I'll say pacing is a big part of it. Right, right, and that was something particularly with Gone in the Night that I really wanted. I wanted it to be something that someone could pick up and they finish a chapter and they're like, oh wait, I've got to keep going. You know? Yeah, can't put so it down. I, right? I wanted it to yeah. be a good flow to it. So. Yeah, that's that's kind of and that particular book. Yeah, as you mentioned, it's gotten a lot of attention and um, we've been really grateful for that. And um, but, you know, you mentioned, you know, the, the publishing side of it. Yeah. And one thing that because I've learned a couple things coming into it that I didn't realize, you know, initially. Um, and that's that, the, you know, it's really hard to make money. Um, with books, even if you have a book that's like semi successful, you you really have to be, um, you know, a Stephen King to, to make real money. With, very top heavy, right? With, author, with right? books, like like our contract is set up, and it's it's changed a little bit, but I you know I think the initial contract with that one was that we get twenty percent of sales um, up to two thousand books. Um, well, the vast majority of, of books that are out there selling don't sell 2,000 copies. Mm -hmm. If someone gets published, yeah. um, there's millions of books out there. You, they might sell a couple hundred or something like that. It's unusual to sell more than, mm -hmm. than 2,000. And then it mm -hmm. kind of staircases up. And if we sell 5,000 copies of that book, which I think we're around 2,000 now altogether, then we'll get like 50-50. Then it's a 50-50 split. But it's really, really hard yeah, to sell right. five thousand copies of yeah. a book if you're not known. Yeah. yeah. Was there anything like with uh, probably not advances? I'm sure that's all like all the, the big right. authors, right? Was there anything with having to commit to more than one or options or like right a first refusal, anything like that? Like in cases of a crazy success, they do, yeah, you have to come to us next time or yeah, something. Yeah, they all have right of a first refusal, pretty much. You know, like they want if you're if you're writing a book, they want you to send it to them and for them to consider it, even if but but even in those situations, because he's worked with a couple other publishers, um, he can send it to them, and even if they want to publish it, if he likes this other publisher, he can still turn it down. Well, that's pretty good, then. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's not such a big thing. One thing that is interesting, though, is, and I've wondered about this from other authors, is we have to kind of count on our publisher being a good guy in terms of telling us the numbers. Mm -hmm. There's no way to know what we've actually sold. Really? Mm -hmm. There's no way to know. You know, and there's yeah. different there's different venues like we're selling on Amazon, but we also sell on Barnes and Noble. And he sends us, you know, quarterly or, or I think it's uh, twice a year, a spreadsheet that shows what's been sold. You know, but I've thought that that was really interesting. And like, he might be, and I'm just gonna assume he is a great guy who would never lie. Mm -hmm. But it seems like an area where publishers could really take advantage of people mm -hmm. if they wanted to and it'd be really hard to verify how would I yeah. how would I be able to show that we sold 5,000 instead of 2,000 like yeah so for all, do you think they take advantage of people like that? I think it I, I definitely some think do. it's it's possible I wish that there was some sort of database for authors out there where yeah. people could know like okay there's an outside agency that's kind of looking at this you mm -hmm. know that they have to report numbers to and mm -hmm. can be audited or something yeah. like that and it's just be nice to know how you're performing also like right yeah it's just like a good feedback to know what works and how right you're doing it because as it is he has uh like i said i, I think he's a great guy with argus books um william connor's his name uh, but he he d does have every incentive to lie. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. well, no, you actually didn't sell that much. Yeah. Oh, oh well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever consider self-publishing? Yes. Not? Yeah. It, it's just uh, that's expensive, and then you've got to you miss some of the connections. Yeah. You know, with uh, like we wouldn't have been if we self-published, we wouldn't have been able to get into Barnes and, and Noble. Yeah. You know. Do you know what kind of split the sales has been? You, so you said Amazon and Barnes and Noble are only places that physical books. Is there a place besides Barnes and Noble that sells? That's well, like, like we have a, a, a bookstore in Springfield, ABC Books, that we worked with, and I actually did a, a book signing there um, when we released our last book, which is called Shadow Valley. 
<laughs> um, and, uh, you know, so there are independent ones, but I mean, something like nine out of 10 books that are sold are sold either at Barnes and Noble or through Amazon. Do you know between those two, does it, you get told kind of the split half and half? Does it sway one way, the other way a lot or? I think, I know for us, most of the books have sold on Amazon for Good. sure. Okay. Good. Yeah, because I, I was gonna say, it seems like you're right, the connections you'd miss, but it'd be, as an Amazon seller, it's really easy to tell how much of something sells on there mm -hmm. when, you put, when you put it on there, but I'm sure there's a trade-off to that as well. Right. You, right, right, right. Yeah, and publicity or however they, do, do they do anything to try to publicize or push the books or is that mostly on? No, you? that's on us too, which that part was a little frustrating too. Now, if you get into what I would consider maybe an, an A-list publisher, um, uh, and some of the, the names of the, of the big dogs are escaping me. They definitely spend money on that sort of thing, but they're, they, they pretty much know if, if they're gonna take you on that we're gonna sell X number of books, yeah. you know, and these are the, the markets that we're gonna sell in and that sort of thing. We've done our own marketing on Facebook, just trying to get people interested and mostly focused in the in the Springfield area. Makes sense. Yeah, but we've done Kansas City and St. Louis too, and that sort of thing. So, so you would say, in, in your best estimate, you said uh, most books never sell two thousand copies. Right, and I'm kind of going off of, of well, an article I read, and then something William had said. He he said that that one uh, gone in the night has sold it you know at least about 10 times what an average book would sell that's, good. Cool. that's, good. that's yeah. cool yeah so we're you know we're happy with that and and you know the, the feedback has been good it's been interesting though too because not everyone is a is a huge fan of mixing fact and fiction yeah. mm -hmm. um, but we have found that the people who actually have read the book um get it you know and, and yeah. like um, I've spoken with uh, um, the the mother of one of the, the women who, who disappeared, mm -hmm. um, and she had read the book and liked it, and that was like a big thing for me because I was like, oh gosh, you know, yeah. I always kind of had that in my mind, like there are real people attached to this who are going to read this, yeah. and what are they going to think, and you know, so she she was really um, someone who uh, Miss McCall. Uh, who, you know, made me feel better about it, but it also made it tough to kind of replicate that sort of setup because uh, in most cases, I think to really do the book right, you've really got to get out there and interview people yeah. and treat it like a nonfiction and then write it, you know, more like a fiction. Um, and so the last two books we've done, Shadow Valley and then this one that um, is gonna, I've got, we've got a new one that's coming out March 10th, um, and that's called Mirror in the Shadows. And um, those are both been fully fictional. So they're not really based on, on anything. Um, they're just, you know, coming from uh, our own minds and, and that sort of thing. Um, we do have a loose sort of connection to, um, uh, well, we were inspired by the case of Gina Dawn Brooks um, in this last one, which is a real case from uh, Fredericktown, uh, Missouri. Um, but it's we go a totally different direction with it and change the names and all of that. So, sure. But yeah, it's it, it's tricky, you know, <laughs> yeah. with, with with that sort of thing because you really do. There are real people out there, and you don't want to. Um, offend anybody or, or hurt anybody yeah. or or be seen as like okay we're really trying to capitalize on this with gone in the night it was one it's a cold case from 20 years ago 29 years ago now and we were really hoping we could help bring more attention to the case like if this catches on maybe that will will reinvigorate the case and yeah you know i've talked with a, a detective you know on the, the springfield police department and he's told me that they've They've gotten leads, um, you know, as a result of the book. So that's that's really good. Nothing has happened, <laughs> sure. but it has it has drummed up interest, and that's important. Yeah. yeah. So, 
Yeah. Anybody got anything else? Think we? Um, I've heard of the three. Yeah. So I am super interested to see how you mixed fact with fiction. Yeah. I'm yeah. definitely gonna read it. Yeah. Well, good. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Let me know what you think. I mean, we we really try to. I I told people I think the book has a good heart, um, and so I'm I'm hoping that 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 comes across when you read it and. Um, we definitely really hope and want that case to be solved and um, the, the, the girls uh, who went missing were a year um, older than me. They graduated in 1992. This happened in June of 1992 and I graduated in 1993. And so, um, you know, they would be my age. They would be a, a year older now if they were still around. So, Did so. you know them? No, no, I knew, and, and this was kind of true of most people, uh, you know, in Springfield at that time, particularly if you were my age, you knew someone who knew someone who knew them, if you didn't sure. know them. <laughs> yeah. Big, you know, yeah. 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 yeah, 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 so. Yeah, I love it. Well, that's quite an idea. Yeah. And if this was a new story to me, but that's, if you, yeah. that's me. I know that you're like, I hope you feel a heart in it. Obviously, since I've met you, it'll be much easier <laughs> to, you know, Right. See it from your perspective and how you put all of this into it. Yeah, yeah. So it was um, really uh, hard <laughs> to do, uh, but you know, really satisfying. There is something about now that I've done it a few times, uh, going through the process and writing a book. It's really um, you're putting a lot of yourself into it, and I have a whole new respect for people who <laughs> who do that. Um, and I'm, I'm really impressed by people like Stephen King who have made a career with it, and I, I think that's uh, incredible. So, yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. This has been episode 16, right? Yes. 16 of the Daily Crew, and a special thank you again. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you again. Uh, Mirror in the Shadows out March 10th. Yeah, check so it out, check Brian it Brown, out. Uh, probably the easiest way, on Amazon, Brian Brown, author Brian Brown, you'll find some books on there, and I assume well written, I don't read a whole lot, but I'm sure they're good. <laughs> Alright, thank you for watching and for listening. Thanks guys. Later.